and we are recording. I was going to try to do an introduction thing here to see how it felt. Um, <gasps> yes. Welcome to Everything is Gay, Even the Straight Stuff, uh, which is a phrase which always makes my um, D&D friends giggle. I am John McDonald, American queer playwright, uh, and also Stardew Farmer on the Instagram, and then my name, but with a weird bunch of numbers following on Twitter because I joined late, and so it's not very easy to find. <laughs> and I'm Magnus L. Alexander, um, English gay romance and erotica writer, um, and I'm here with <clears throat> your lovely self, sir, uh, to discuss, what are we discussing again today? I wonder whether the traditional Christmas movie isn't really seen as sort of a big temple project that the studios feel comfortable putting in the cinema, but streaming services, which are more of a direct to audience means for them, might work better from their perspective. I can see that because one of the movies, so the two of the movies that I saw the past couple of years, because I just don't see many movies in theaters anymore. Like it has to be like, I was really looking forward to the Bob's Burgers movie, which is now going to be a next summer release. Um, I'm going to be dressing up as a uh, regular size Rudy for that, by the way. Um, mm -hmm. Very excited to try to find an asthma inhaler so I can be very accurate. Uh, but so like, I think like movies like Ocean's 8, which is one of my favorite and only favorite heist movies. Um, that's the Sandra Bullock one, where it's the all-female cast with Kate Blanchett, fabulous movie. Mm. Um, not a Christmas movie, but it's like a movie celebrating May because it takes place during uh, the um, during the Met Ball. Um, but like, so a Christmas movie or like something like Book Club that I saw with a friend isn't really going to compare to the kind of big tent poles coming out, which is apparently this, these are all coming out on Wednesday, December 22nd at the same time. Matrix Resurrections, which I'm really excited to see uh, on HBO Max. Sing 2, Sing 2, which the dreamy Skylar Aston is having a role in, and I have no idea what it is. Oh, and, God. The, and the Kingsman, which is the Kingsman prequel. Um, uh, like they're so all they're coming out the same day. So like, Oh, and Canto comes out on the day before Christmas too. And Canto comes out, which is the kind of, I guess, ah. oh, it's Colombian. That's what it is. It's a Colombian. Yes. Country. I am incredibly excited to see Encanto. Um, just this, from what I've seen the trailers and some photos and such, and from what I've heard, it's going to be right up my street. Um, it sounds really endearing. It does sound, from what I've um, discovered, I've been really trying really hard not to find out any spoilers or anything about the plot. But from uh, what I've heard, I, I don't know if you have a box lunch near you or if you can get to the website, but they have an Encanto backpack that looks like the house. Super cute. No. Um, I could not oh. afford it, but super cute. Yeah, oh. I love the... I love the aesthetic. The aesthetic of Coco and the aesthetic of kind of Encanto together is really great. Um, also, this year, coming out on December 31st, right at the end of the year, the Peter Dinklage, Cyrano de Bergerac movie, um, which I had heard about a little bit. So, very excited about what, that. Hmm, I hadn't heard about this one. What, sorry, what's it about? Uh, so, Cyrano de Bergerac, the one where he thinks he's super ugly, so he hires a handsome guy. Um, oh. Yeah, so Cyrano de Bergerac, I don't remember, uh, so Peter Dinklage is playing Cyrano, um, hmm. and I can't figure out who, I guess Brian Tyree Henry is going to be the handsome stand-in for Cyrano. Uh, they did an episode of it on Bob's Burger, actually, <laughs> where they did a Cyrano, huh. like, if you ever hear someone say they're doing a Cyrano, Cyrano de Bergerac-like plot, which I'm doing air quotes for, which no one can see because it's a podcast, um it, it's a it's a rather traditional theater technique about kind of unrequited love and not being caught up in um uh, in looks uh penelope with christina ricci is kind of the girl version of cyrano in my mind uh but cyrano is a fairly famous thing i'm surprised there's not a cyrano panto at christmas time because it's got a really mm. uplifting ending so i'm gonna have to look into that i'll have you send me some details about it later? 
I like hmm. Peter Dinklage. I like Peter Dinklage on SNL. I didn't see him in Game of Thrones. I didn't see Game of Thrones. But I like Peter Dinklage in pretty much everything I've seen him in. So. Even Pixels? Um, I didn't see Pixels because I don't really oh. care for Adam Sandler. I, I love Peter Dinklage in Elf, though. Elf as the angry uh, as the angry short person in the board meeting that uh, hits Will Ferrell a lot. Like I thought was a fan of that. I think that was him. Elf from two thousand and three. It got a four point six audience rating summary, according to Facebook, I guess, or something like that. Um, how do you feel about Elf as a movie? No, I've just caused a lot of gas to the audience. I haven't seen Elf. I don't know why. Start just... sending you like Elf merchandise or something like that. Like we'll get a big fan base come back to episode one, and they'll be oh. like sending you Elf on DVD. You'll just be like deluge with Will Ferrell products. Yes, I'll just receive a bunch of um, those spandex tights. But is it spandex tights that he wears, uh... or is it nylon tights or something? I think it's spandex because they look like ballet tights. They look like what they had at the end of Billy Elliot and in Center Stage and Fame, which I think are ballet tights are all spandex. I don't I don't really know. Mm. <laughs> I'll have a bunch of them sent through the post and I'll have to uh, take a picture of wearing all of them. I mean, that sounds like a party to me. That doesn't sound like a bad thing. Um, oh, that, oh, going off on one into my slight fantasies here. Men in ballet tights. And the full-on beautiful outfits. It, I could look at ballet dancers for days, shall we say. That's why you like Once Upon a Time, because when they go into the past, they all wear, except for a grown-up Henry, they all wear the tights and the fur coats and and everything. <laughs> everything Colin Colin O'Donny Colin O'Donoghue <laughs> wore was uh, um, was about as skin tight as it could get away with in a Disney show. <laughs> God bless. Very- Yes, the gratuitous uh, tight male male clothing was always a pleasant surprise in that series. Um, But you say in the past, but they did have some episodes where they were in the present, but they'd ended up back in the fantasy world and such. Um, Uh, You know what? If I had Lana Perilla's cleavage, I would also wear a bustier down to my nipple line. So, like, I'm, Um, I'm not mad about it. Like, gorgeous like not mad with elf there's a bit of a element of um the otherness in there um yeah. because will farrell is from a, has been raised a completely different culture and well supposedly is returning to his home country but it's not really his home country um because really all he's ever known is elfdom yeah really. and and bob um, newhart plays his like uh, plays his found family dad as like the elf who is raising the Will Ferrell child who is amusingly taller than all the other elves um, mm. which I appreciate I know what you mean about um, man children characters um, some of the roles that James Corden has played in the past come across oh. that and I like, tell you, I'm really glad we're souring on him in America. Like, I know that you gave him to us, like you were trying to get him out of your country. So, like, he became like an American thing. But I'm so glad people are starting to get tired of James Corden because that 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 is that veneer has worn down like hard. You could actually also do the voyeuristic. You haven't seen Elf, so you'll have to see Elf before we can actually talk about it. There's a scene in Elf where Will Ferrell is in the bathroom. And Zoe Deschanel is showering in this fictional department store, and he has the mind of a child, so like nothing untoward happens. But it's obviously both very sweet and off-putting, and also it was an excuse for Zoe Deschanel to sing, uh, because before she was like new girl, um, she was she was in a kind of twee group thing, a music group. Um, and so, like, even just deconstructing Will Ferrell in this imaginary department store, like, and the voyeuristic implications of essentially, essentially, it was like that scene in Pitch Perfect, um, where the redhead opens Anna Kendrick's shower thing to, like, invite her into the acapella group, uh, which launched a thousand, a thousand chips for that movie. But it's very much that, which is really the only um almost sexualization but not 
thing I can think of even in straight Christmas films. That was a lot mm. to process. I apologize. That was a very long <laughs> one to think. You have to see the scene. Like it's it's yes. hard to describe the scene without going, it sounds a little weird. It sounds a little creepy. It does indeed. And it's piqued my interest from a pure from a purely academic point of view. And also just because it sounds so bizarre. I think it's the <laughs> only it's the only Will Ferrell man child movie I actually like. It took me a long time to warm up to it. Um, mm. I have a thing about people playing man-child characters. It really, I don't care for oh, it at oh. all. Well, um, didn't but, he do something called Step Brothers or something? Yeah, he did Step Brothers with John C. Reilly. John yeah. C. Reilly tempered him a little bit. Um, they were in the ballad mm. of Ricky Bobby or wh whatever the race car movie they did was. They play those same mm. characters, essentially. Uh, Bob Newhart is Elf Dad, though. Um, so you've got a Bob Newhart cameo at the beginning and at the end, which is great. Um, the Dad in Elf was really good. Like the like the like the supporting cast in Elf was amazing. Mm. Um, let's right. see if I find so James Can plays the dad. Ed Asner is Santa Claus. Uh, my favorite is the mom, Mary Steenberger, um, who's married to Ted Danson sure. and had a cameo at the end of The Good Place. Mary Steenberger is in it. Uh, John Favreau is in it, which I always forget. Um, Amy Sedaris is in it. I did not realize that. I don't know who she plays. Um, any case, yeah, I, it's one of those things where like, I would like you to see Elf if for no other reason than to tell me what you think of the non-creepy, creepy shower scene. <laughs> I shall see it. Elf. Mm, I do, I'll do my best. Um, we have movies that have a definite cringe factor to it. And the reason I say it will have a definite cringe factor is you mentioned about um, men playing man-child yeah. characters and such i expect there to be some cringe in it um which is There's not always the reason the thing this yes. is this isn't like will ferrell playing a man child in, in that soccer movie where he's like coaching his kid's soccer team or the many iterations of the man children he played on snl uh he has right. a reason and the, the whole conceit is that elf is about will ferrell is raised by elves at the north pole and because this is that kind of Rudolph the Red-Nosed Reindeer version of elves that are very like mm -hmm. off in the North Pole. So like the man-child thing is not as bad as it is, but it's still very much that. And for me, the side characters are the only thing that kept me invested in the movie enough to make it work. It's, it's not, mm -hmm. it's definitely not the worst Christmas movie you're ever gonna see. Um, and even Zoe Deschanel, who I cannot warm to to save my life, um, even though I sit through her in Tin Man um, and some parts of New Girl, like it, 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 it gets you there. It, give, it gives you the holiday vibe you, you want to need. With my family, we all have different tastes. So finding that film or play that can just be easily watched is um, uh, it's a must. It's an essential for our seasonal get togethers. <laughs> um, like the, so the last play we watched a few years back, um, we went and saw Annie when it was playing in Oxford. Oh, uh, that was a interesting one. So which, never, which version of Annie was it? It was a stage musical version. It was the one touring within the UK. Um, I honestly don't know who did it. Um, it was a oh, it was a proper like West End style over the top um performance now you see i didn't really know much about annie so um oh, annie is one of my least favorite musicals uh, of all time so. <laughs> it, oh, it's so no annie's and newsies the unbridled optimism of both annie's and newsies just rubs me the wrong way i love cara burnett so i really like tourism as hannigan in the version she did but like mm. the concept of the movie just rubs me so many of the wrong ways how we are in this household is we're, we're very deep into Christmas. Well, we're deep into holidays in general. You should see what the hell we do for Halloween, for God's sakes. <laughs> but uh, in terms of Christmas, yes, we we tend to watch a lot of Christmas classics, um, so black and whites and such. Um, recently, we watched um, Cinderella from, I think it was, ooh, it was from the 1960s, I believe. I'd have to double check which one it was. 
Was, was this a uh, Julie Andrews telecast or Mary Martin as the godmother or? No, it was the Slipper and the Rose. It, it was a proper classic um, bit of Christmas fair. I'll have to check when the date for that was. But anyway, um, it had very much a pantomime theme to it. Uh, despite the fact it was all live action, uh, set within the countryside, lots of lovely swooping castles and such. Um, it was absolutely packed to the gills with humour and all sorts of original songs. For those in our audience who are like me, who are in America, can you briefly explain what a panto is? Because the only panto I've ever heard of was referenced on Are You Being Served? I don't actually know how many people know what a panto is. So that may require some explanation. Panto is short for pantomime, and it's a theatre performance where characters act in a, a certain over-the-top way, um, like very, very clearly happy or very clearly like distraught or sad. Um, there's a, it's more, it's not so much focused, I would say, on the acting, although there is acting in there. It's more focused on over-the-top performance. It, in a sense, Panto is pure entertainment. So it's usually um, around Christmas time here in the UK, It'll be, say, Cinderella, Sleeping Beauty, um, and there's some pro oh, there's some proper English esque ones like Dick Whittington. <laughs> oh my God, best yes. name for a play ever. So, um, looking back at the <clears throat> Slipper and the Rose, which makes for a good Christmas movie. Yes, um, I do apologise. I was off by a decade. It's uh, 1976 that it was out. <laughs> Um, but it, quite interestingly, it was a Royal Command performance. So it was done it, so that it could be shown to the Queen and her extended family. Oh, wow, that's neat. Mm. And to the point that actually the Queen Mother, God bless her when she was around. The Queen um, Mother. Oh, I love it. We don't have a Queen <laughs> She said that the music was actually some of the best that she'd heard from a theatrical production. So she was lauding praise on it. So it was quite an interesting little uh, ditty, shall we say. It does and come up in the list of popular 1976 movies, but on like the third page of it, and definitely not in America, because in America 1976, this was mm. the year that Rocky came out. Uh, mm. This was the year of The First Omen, Taxi Driver, uh, The Bad News Bears, All the President's Men. So, like, we weren't really getting movies like that in 1976. Carrie was out in 1976. Oh. So, we were doing something completely different over here. Oh, my. Yeah. Hmm. It had quite a few face, uh, familiar faces in it, though. Uh, Richard Chamberlain, Anita Crosby, Margaret Lockwood, uh, Kenneth Moore. They, they all had parts to play in this, so... It was a bit of a who's who of uh, vintage uh, British actors, shall we say. Oh, I love Margaret Lockwood's eyebrows. Just, I'm looking at a picture of Margaret Lockwood. She's got that really great kind of Maureen O'Hara. Um, mm -hmm. Like you've got some people over there that have done crazy thin brows like Fanny Craddock, but like Margaret Lockwood really shaped those brows to her face. And that's amazing. If nothing else, I think anyone that goes to view the film will love the fairy godmother in this. So the film, it, it, so I might have mentioned before, the film is a take on the Cinderella fairy tale, but it does a lot more with it than a lot of other productions have done. It goes into the backstory of the prince and the fairy godmother quite a bit. The fairy godmother is a very put upon lady who's currently juggling about six, seven different assignments. So she's visiting Cinderella, but she's like, oh, I got to make time for this. I got to make time for that, etc." And it's just great. Um, and it then goes on. So after Cinderella is introduced to the king, it actually continues the story and shows how they eventually overcome social prejudice and actually end up properly together. But it's still done in a very comical bent. So... Yeah, it has quite a bit to its name, shall we say. 
So here's something interesting. In the 1970s, and this came out in 76, Richard Chamberlain had pretty much cornered the market on kind of the slipper in the rose character type. Um, Because he'd been in Lady Caroline Lamb, The Three Musketeers, and The County Monte Cristo at that point. Um, Within three or four years of The Slipper in the Rose. Um, He also did work on Broadway with Mary Tyler Moore um, in Go Lightly, which is kind of fun. And then he was Mm -hmm. also, in the 90s, he was a big guest star on shows like Will and Grace and Drew Carey. Um, Mm -hmm. And he also appeared as Ebenezer Scrooge in a Broadway national tour of Scrooge the Musical, which I don't know which version of Scrooge that is, but there are many of them, Mm -hmm. so. (laughs) Oh. That makes me think at some point we should have a Muppets discussion as well. Oh, yes, but that's kind of its own thing. I would like to talk about the Muppets and about how subversive they are. And I think most people agree that Muppet Christmas Carol is one of the best Christmas Carol versions. Yes. Um, I don't disagree with that, but I also also think there's some lesser-known Scrooge versions, like the one with Vanessa Williams, Mm. that is just amazing. And getting back to Christmas, a lot of these films are kind of indie films from the time. Uh, When you look at It's a Wonderful Life in 1946, um, Mm. it was not well liked when it first came out. People really thought it was too saccharine and they were moving away from saccharine movies, Um, which is kind of weird to say. uh, But like, if you look at Jimmy Stewart's other stuff like uh, Mr. Deeds where it's super dramatic or the Philadelphia story, where it's a super hilarious movie that is about three people that are totally in a threesome, but not in a threesome at all. I don't know if you've ever seen the Philadelphia story, but it's basically about Jimmy Stewart and I think it's Cary Grant eye banging for two hours. And both of them are also somehow in love with Catherine Hepburn. Um, There was a movie that Sarah Jessica Parker did where she like quotes a line, a very famous line from it. Um, something about a ship being yar, which I'm still not sure what that means. But it's basically a movie about a threesome, essentially. Um, even the end of the film kind of makes it look like they're all getting married to each other. Uh, if you've never seen Philadelphia Story, it's an amazing movie. If you're if you're listening to this podcast and you've never seen it, whatever you're doing at the end of it, go see Philadelphia Story. Not the Tom Hanks movie where he has AIDS, which we should talk about at some point, but it's the Philadelphia mm-hmm. Story and it's Jimmy Stewart, Catherine Hepburn, and I want to say Cary Grant. Mm. Uh, your um, mentioned about in- gay, sorry, not gay. <laughs> your mention about Christmas indie movies actually leads me nicely on to another one that I've got to bring to the table today. Ooh, is it um, Christmas in um, Connecticut? Because I want to talk about Christmas in Connecticut. No, it's not Christmas Connecticut, um, but we can definitely touch upon that as well. I mentioned it to you in a previous conversation, uh, Nick and Nora's Infinite Playlist. Now, the the reason why this is Christmas connected um, is it takes place around the holidays. Um, In this film, you um, have, it's it's an indie film, it's about two young people, uh, Michael Sierra, and I think it's Kat Dennings, I'd need to double check that. It is Um, Kat Dennings. it is excellent. Uh, thank you, sir. I know you, I always love the fact that you have my back. <laughs> I mean, I can always Google something, but also because it's the only thing Kat Dennings has been in that I can recall besides the first Thor movie I think she was in. And yes. um, that show where she plays a waitress that isn't funny, but two, they have a laugh track behind it. Two Broke um, Girls, I believe that one's called. Yeah, not a, yes. not a funny show. Waste of Jennifer Coolidge talent, but that, that's how I feel about it. So Michael Sierra and Kat Dennings play um, two young people that randomly meet one one night um, after Michael Sierra's queer core band, with him being the one straight boy within this queer core band with his friends, um, play at a club and Michael's ex-girlfriend is there and to try and, um, who's also, sorry, this ex-girlfriend is also a frenemy of, the, of Kat Dennings. So Kat Dennings, um, totally embarrassed, uh, turns around to Michael and says, just go along with this. And before Michael Sierra's character knows what's happening, he gets his face knocked off, which, you know, it's Kat Dennings. So it's not exactly a bad, 
Now, now for uh, now for us Americans, getting snogged off is just like hardcore making out, right? Is that what it is? So the so Cat Dennings is eating Michael Sarah's face off, and then recklessly at the same time, it's announced that this very popular underground indie band, um, Chasing Rabbits, Rabbit Chasers, or some ridiculous name, it's not important. Um, they are hosting a secret gig somewhere in the city that night. Um, and of course, everyone loves them in the film. So everyone's trying to find out where they are. And it spawns this massive chase around the city, trying to find this um, band in the queer core um, gay band's mystery van, basically. Um, and my at the same time- thought, my, my first thought is, oh my God, that sounds like so much work. There better be like some pizza at some point in this <laughs> Like for me, I'm just thinking, think, oh my god, now I have to go to a new location here. This band, I don't know if I like anybody that much. Like, is it Celine Dion? I don't know if I'd even do that for Celine Dion. <laughs> um, they oh, it gets worse. They have to go into various um places where the band is supposedly played in the past to try and find clues to where they are, and in the end, they find uh, GPS coordinates for where they are. So that's how they ge geocaching the movie. Oh, it sounds it sounds like it sounds like what it sounds like what that poor August Rush orphan kid went through trying to evade Robin Williams and August Rush. <laughs> and at the same time, they're also looking for Kat Denning's other friend who's got massively drunk and is currently lopping around the city. And yes, it, it sounds like a mess. But it does flow together quite well. It is endearing. And the queer elements in it are absolutely marvelous. So uh, all the um, queer core band members don't come across as stereotypical. Um, they do come across as mama bears to Michael Sierra because they hate the ex-girlfriend. And they, they see how nice Kat is and they sort of want to pair them together because they think they'd be good for each other. Um, so they're being very supportive. Um, and there's a drag bar involved at one point. Uh, Michael Sierra gets hit on by a homeless guy as well that offers to take him around a back alley. It, there's a lot of lovely subversive elements in the film, um, but it's still quite sweet at the end of the day. So I do recommend it as something lighthearted, but endearing to watch. Michael Sarah too does a lot of queer esque roles that aren't exactly queer. We talk about everything being gay, even the straight stuff. I feel like Michael Sarah's work kind of lends itself to that. Um, mm. When we talk about camp aesthetic, which is something that I really want to talk about at a certain point, uh, not just because of, of John Waters and Divine, um, but because of things like Richard Simmons, who's in Powder, and movies like Michael Sarah's movies like. Uh, um, the Man Child Dad in Juno, anything featuring Alice and Janney, uh, Scott Pilgrim versus the World is basically camp turned serious in a way. Um, mm -hmm. So there's, it's kind of an interesting thing where we could actually, you could even talk about Scott Pilgrim potentially, because it takes place in like this kind of mythical frozen Canadian winter. Um, and except for Knives Child having class it could technically be a christmas movie i don't actually know if scott pilgrim ever is intentionally set in anything besides canadian winter i don't actually know because i don't know mm. enough about scott pilgrim no it's definitely no i don't know much about the comic uh, source material but you're right that there's a very ambiguous um winter feel to this place um <laughs> but the, oh, I love the queer elements. Um, what's his name? So it's in the film. It the actor that plays Scott's best friend, the roommate who's gay. Uh, he's Macaulay Culkin's older brother in real life. Um, Kier, uh, Kieran Culkin, whose name I cannot say. Oh. Why would you name your child Kieran Culkin? That's such a hard. Like Macaulay <laughs> is difficult enough to say, and then you're just adding. You're adding like so many mm. consonants onto that. I'm I'm sorry, Kieran. I love you. Call me. I mean, technically, Cats can count as a Christmas release due to when it was released, but 
Yeah. I'm not sure if many people will be watching that during the festive season, shall we say. It's not, I would not consider that because I think for, and if we ever do a part three of this or another, or another like holiday theme thing, which we can totally do next year, like, so you've got movies that are about the holidays that have a lot of holiday in them. So I'm thinking about mm-hmm. The Ref, I'm thinking about Jingle All the Way, I'm thinking about uh, both of the Grinches, I guess all three of them, since there's that CGI'd one with Benedict Cumberbatch. Mm-hmm. Um, and they have that kind of aesthetic of Christmas where they have the tree and they have all that. But then you've got the non-Christmas Christmas movies, which are like the holiday, um, Lion in Winter, which is set during Christmas, but there's no real Christmas in it. Um, definitely not the slipper in the rose. It's definitely Catherine Hepburn and uh, a much older, I think it's Peter O'Toole. Yeah, a much older Peter O'Toole um, mm-hmm. killing their children. And also Anthony Hopkins <laughs> in his first major film role. Um, oh. yeah. I don't know if you've ever seen it, but it's not what I would call a happy Christmas movie. It's basically no. Peter O'Toole and Catherine Hepburn game of throning each other verbally for two hours. And then the king, the uh, Prince of France, um, surprising them by showing up. And I think that was, yeah, Timothy Dalton, I believe, plays the king of the, the prince or the king of France. And he had a love affair with the oldest son of um, Henry II, who's Peter O'Toole's character. And so, like, all the sons end up dead at the end of the movie. It's from 1968, so I'm not spoiling everything. If you haven't seen it, you should see it. It happened, apparently, in real life. Um, it's basically Henry II and Eleanor of Aquitaine, Game of Thrones, mm-hmm. Game of Thrones, and their children. And then the great final scene is them laughing and waving at each other as she gets on a boat and drifts off to whatever place she's going to next. <laughs> After all of this hardcore violence during Christmas, um, it's an amazing Christmas movie. It's right up there with Bishop's Wife, which is uh, happier Christmas thing. <laughs> Now, talking about Christmas movie, a sister act is a Christmas movie in my house. It's weird because it's not Christmassy, but it's uh, it's a pretty usual winter Christmas time mm-hmm. movie in my house is, is sister act. And so you've got like Sleepless in Seattle is billed as a Christmas movie on Amazon Prime, but technically it's a New Year's movie. Um, Dick Tracy is the same way, where it's set during a winter celebration, but because there's no Christmas in it, even though it's a Christmas movie, it's actually like a New Year's movie. And the holiday, they mention Christmas Eve, but Kate Winslet hasn't even put up a tree in the house where she's staying at. So really, except for the tree in Jude Law's house where he has his little kids at, um, there's not much Christmas in the holiday. And so you really can break down the idea of a Christmas film into how much Christmas is in the Christmas film. That's a very weird thing to say. Um, one point came to mind. Um, Vanessa Hudgenson. Hudgens? I think, uh, sorry, Vanessa Hudgens. Um, so you mo- you probably know her mostly from high school musical fame. Um, she, I think I actually she, know her from spring break because I didn't see high school musical. So what is she? <laughs> I'm just actually curious. I'm looking at her IMDb page. This is the great thing about having the internet. She, <laughs> she um she did uh sucker punch several years back actually probably a decade oh, ago oh i remember sucker punch yeah. oh such a great um, such yeah. a difficult movie like a great movie but a difficult movie you know i, I don't know how yeah uh, that it, there's a lot to discuss about sucker punch oh she was rizzo uh, in grease live uh, good lord the reason I bring her up is she's branched out into Netflix Christmas movies now. Um, she was the lead star in The Night Before Christmas. And then all of a sudden she did The Princess Switch at about the same time. And that sort of become her main thing now. For, so she's really uh, established herself. I like the name of Princess Switch 2. Princess Switch switched again. Like it happened once. <laughs> oh no! That's great. That makes me so happy. Princess Switch 3 is just Princess Switch 3. That's just a fail right there. Uh, well, the thing is, um, now, I don't know how spoilery we can get here. Can we be spoilery? I always tell people when they're like, don't give me spoilers. I'm like, for me, it's not about 
being spoiled so much as the journey to get there. So if it's a great product or a really bad product that I'm going to fall in love with, um, and I already know what's going to happen. I'm like, I knew what was going to happen in the Dick Tracy movie. Like I knew it was going to happen in the mask. Still loved them. Um, <laughs> so yeah, I mean, I'm looking at the, well, she plays three characters in the Princess Switch movies, Stacy, Margaret, and Fiona. That is amazing. I can barely handle being one person. Yes. Um, well, the fit in universe, if I understand this correctly, um, the reason for that is they're all clones of each other, or at least the ones originally. Oh my the god, clone. it's Christmas Orphan Black? Basically, yes. That's uh, amazing! Uh, um, oh, that sounds like the most, because Orphan Black is already an insane premise, and you add in a Christmas theme to that? That's incredible. Do you oh, oh, I'm so happy you that you told me about this. Oh, you want insanity? I'll give you insanity. So Netflix has confirmed that all of its Christmas movies are interconnected. So, so like Night Before um, Christmas is connected? Because I'm looking at still from is. Night Before Christmas and she's is. kissing this guy that's desperately trying to be from the cast of BBC's Merlin and is failing immensely. But and he is. Well, he's not from the cast of BBC's Merlin. He's an actual prehistoric medieval knight, not prehistoric. Well, he's not riding a dinosaur. He's I mean, a medieval. His, that this chainmail yes. is wearing him. He's not wearing this chain. This chainmail, <laughs> chainmail hoodie that he's got on. That cannot be comfortable. Like, that's just you're just asking to lose hair wearing a chainmail hoodie. Just pro tip for all the fashion designers, you know. <laughs> oh, and he, well, what a lot of people don't realize is that uh, chainmail chafes badly. So you, you would either develop very hard skin or often um, knights would oil themselves in order to prevent too much chafing. So Ooh, where's, be prepared that kind of a, where's that kind of a knight's tale where Alan Tudyk is oiling up Eve Ledger? <laughs> where's that kind of that movie? I'm sorry, I'm gonna, I'm gonna get naughty on main here for a moment. That's a version of Knight's Tale I wanna watch. Mm, well, they're branching out to the gay Netflix movies now, so. It could very well happen. Could very well happen. Um, but th my point was that basically characters from different Netflix holiday movies are appearing as cameos in different ones. So they're actually making an effort to interconnect every one of them. And what's really insane is, so you've got human cloning in the one, you've got magic in the other one, you've got time magic in A Night Before Christmas, the Night Before Christmas, sorry. Which is a great title uh, for a movie, but definitely for like a gay erotica film. I'm, I'm not even sorry about it. <laughs> uh, if I ever get around to it, I'll write that one as well. Like, um, I'm sorry, the amount of daddyfication that's happened for Santa Claus in the past couple of years in the queer art community, like, did uh, not see that coming at all. And I'm looking at stills. Yeah. I'm looking at stills from uh, The Princess Switch Switched Again. Did they steal the set designer from the queen? Because it definitely looks like whoever designed the set for the queen did this kind of beige mm. curtained Rococo style room. And I also love the only difference between the two Vanessa Hudgens is one is wearing red, one is wearing beige, and they have two very different yet similarish hairstyles somehow. Like I don't know. I'm having I'm having fun just with the steals from from this movie. It's really crazy, and the third one's coming out very soon, and it's about stolen diamonds, and the and it turns into a, a semi spy movie as they're trying to get the the jewels back. I will say I do like this kind of gray floral dress that they put Vanessa in here and switched again. Mm -hmm. It's like a it's like a ball gown a little bit, very. I like that. It's nice. I appreciate mm. that. But the thing is, by interconnecting them, um, they allow the facts about what happens in the one to come into the others as well. So the reason I mention this is in the um, a print. Oh, I'm going to get these names wrong. A Prince for Christmas, the Christmas Baby. Um, it's the one that starred the actress that was Tinkerbell in Once Upon a Time. Um, oh, I forget her name. Yeah, I don't um, know. I can see her face. 
Um, I felt the same way about her that I felt about Belle, but that's neither here nor there. Um, we'll get to that. <laughs> we'll get to my yeah. feelings on Belle. Um, In that movie, um, it becomes revealed that unless this treaty is signed with this foreign power that's been kept for centuries and centuries and centuries, a curse will fall upon the child of the, of the royal couple. And it just so happens that she's heavily pregnant and is about to have her child. So, and when the treaty is stolen, it's a race against time because some people are saying, oh, the curse is real. And other people are going, it's an old superstition. But by interconnecting it with the other Netflix movies where magic is confirmed to be a real thing, it then becomes apparent that if they hadn't done it, the child would have got whatever curse it was. Do they never identify what the curse is? Or is it just like such a bland curse you can't remember? I can't remember <laughs> what it was. It wasn't anything like, oh, the child into, can die. So he doesn't like turn into that. Krampus or something? If you don't sign this treaty, your child turns into Krampus? <laughs> That's how you interconnect it and get the guy from Parks and Rec, who's the dad in the Krampus movie. But I, I haven't heard yet if Single All The Way is part of the shared Netflix uh, Christmas multiverse thing. Um, I, I, I mean, it's the gays. Were. Were there, are there any other gays in the other Christmas Prince movies? Are there any gay princes Ooh. out there? Well, there's no gay princes, but there was a... Um, there, oh, what was he? Um, I think he was a, a fashion set designer that was in the... Uh, a prince for Christmas, and she he gets together with the gay best friend oh of God. the main female character. I know. I will say <laughs> my only really thing like... about that that is nice is that though it is a stereotype, um, that does harken back to the first queer character that was ever on American television. Um, because mm. the first queer character, and I have the book about this, I have no idea where the book is. Um, but the first queer character on television ever was this very, very femme um, Broadway head of wardrobe that was super, super mm. gay. Um, and so it's a nice call back to like the first queer character in TV, mm. but like that was part of what I liked about that Royals TV show that was done where it was like super pop oriented, like the Marie Antoinette movie, mm. um, was that they had like Royal upper class people that were just like casually gay like, of mm. course, if you have that much money, why wouldn't you, like, be super sexual with everyone? Because, like, mm. when you have enough money, there are just no rules for you anymore, apparently. <laughs> so I'm all about that. And not having enough gay princes, like, that's a problem for me. I would very much enjoy Single All the Way if it had been, like, gay prince coming to small Christmas town, you know? I wouldn't have been mad about that. The main um, love interest, Nick, in um single way um is pretty much his name is saint? i hope his last name is saint because you're missing an opportunity oh, to no. name your character nick and don't name him saint i don't think it, oh, i don't remember i don't think his last name was saint i don't even remember if they did mention what his last name was that's just a missed opportunity know. right there like you have so oh. many names in christmas canon like come on, if you're going to name your character Nick, you have to name them Saint as their last name. Like, that's, there's a rule, I think, somewhere. You have to do that. There's a rule. There's got to be. Yes, but you'd be getting too close to Saint Nick at the end of the day. And how many Saint Nicks are out there, really? Look, you know what? If Steve Gutenberg can play the son of Santa Claus to find love, I don't know if you ever saw these. They're amazing. It's, it's a set of two Christmas movies um about steve gutenberg as santa's son falling in love and they're like not lifetime movies but they're made by the company um and they are amazing if you've never if you've never seen them mm. um steve gutenberg as i think it's steve gutenberg uh as saint nick's son looking for love because if he doesn't find love all the magic is going to go out in the universe Oof, uh, which, not just the world the universe the universe yeah okay so it's Ow. yes okay so here it's called Single Santa Seeks Mrs. Claus is the name of the movie. And then that the just sounds very cringy. And then the follow-up is Meet the Santa, and it's from 2004, 2005, and it's very Steve Gutenberg-y. Um, and I actually think the woman in Meet the Santa that he ends up falling in love with is uh, 
Julianne Ho, Derek Ho's sister, Ho, Hoogs, Ho's, I don't, I don't know how to say her last name. <laughs> anyway, if you've never seen it, 2004, it's amazing. <laughs> um, oh, and it's, okay. yeah, I, I highly recommend Single Santa Seeks Mrs. Claus, and then they follow up Meet the Santas, where, of course, Julianne Ho's mom hates Christmas, and so Steve Gutenberg's mission in life is to gaslight her into enjoying Christmas by continually <laughs> using his magic to over-decorate her house little by little. That is literally the whole second act of the movie, is making the mom feel insane as her Christmas tree grows and grows throughout the course of the movie. It's incredible. I was going to say, that almost feels like it has some almost chilling horror connotations. Imagine this. You're, you're someone that doesn't like Christmas, but Christmas is determined to take over your home. So oh, it, it's slow at first. You know, it's a bit of tinsel outside, some lights in the tree across the street. And before you know it, it's creeping inside your house. It's decorating yeah, every corner. It's coming up the stairs. Before you know it, your bedroom's oh, covered in tinsel. It's everywhere. <laughs> I mean, Meet the Santas is pretty much the non-Disney version of Santa Claus 2. And anything I can do that has less Tim Allen in it, I'm all for. Um, <laughs> But it kind of has that vibe of people that have like repressed their love for Christmas, um, but they secretly love Christmas because in all of these movies, like I don't think there's a single movie about Hanukkah or Kwanzaa where someone doesn't already love them. Like there's no secretly I love this winter holiday, but I have mm. to pretend I don't. Like I think it's just like a Christmas trope of rich mom gets accosted by the spirit of Christmas, essentially, because her daughter is marrying Steve Gutenberg, which is enough punishment <laughs> in and of itself, really. Oh, days. Mm. No, I will have to definitely check that out at some point. I shall add it to my incredibly long list of things that I eventually will watch, read, mm. and experience. The, the Eternal Struggle, which I'm sure a lot of people are familiar with. Uh, this is also, if you uh, when you see it, Single Santa Seeks Mrs. Claus and Meets the Santas, this is the only time John Wheeler plays Santa, and also Mrs. Claus in this movie wears a matching jogging set in red oh, wow. with, with um, gray tassels on it. It's like a matching jogging set they wear for most of the movie, um, and they have this dinner scene where he's just like full-on lobster napkin in front of him and it's incredible oh, that would right. actually make a great conversation point to have at some, in a future chat um interpretations of santa and mrs santa like what are, are your favorite interpretations of this archetype um because i because in time i've seen a lot of very interesting versions of these characters yeah. Um, some were played quite traditionally, others um, not so much. Uh, I'm also struggling to come up with some perfect examples off the top of my head at the second, but if I can go back through my past. Here's my thing. I really loved uh, The Bishop's Wife and The Preacher's Wife, uh, where you have people playing angels. Mm -hmm. For me, when I think of Mrs. Claus, I actually think of Santa Claus too. I like the idea of this high school principal Who's kind of got her heart out her shell but inside it has to do with the idea of the struggle about what femininity means what it means to have responsibility and care and except for tim allen i think santa claus too is great it's the tim allen that gets in the way of everything and i only say that now knowing as much as i know about him but like mm -hmm. santa claus one and two if they had had a different lead i think they would be two of the best christmas movies maybe ever made um judge reinhold as I don't know if you've ever seen the Santa Claus movie or Santa Claus Two, yeah. Judge, Judge Reinhold, one of my favorite '80s actors, plays like uh, plays the stepdad, and he's not a bad stepdad. He's just like a guy that wears Christmas sweaters and is really nice. And people just dunk on him throughout the movie constantly. Like they make fun of the Christmas sweater that people have bought for him. Um, they they he gets actively concerned when um, Tim Allen's Santa kind of kidnaps his son and like yes. everyone's like, you shouldn't get concerned about that. And I'm like, it's yeah. a custody thing. So maybe some concern is warranted as we watch it, this 
yeah. dad devolve into like what looks like dementia essentially. Um, yeah, Santa Claus, Santa Claus 2, minus Kamel and great films. Oh, days. Yes. Uh, so we are, this is part two of our discussion about holiday themed things. Um, there's probably even more discussions to be had because eventually we'll get to a place where we can talk about things like holiday noir, like uh, Blue Velvet and Kiss Kiss Bang Bang, mm. which are kind of more indie holiday things. But um, I am kind of an aesthetic Christmas fiend and you're kind of a romantic Prince and I Netflix Christmas movie. <laughs> aficionados so I, I don't know what you had planned for today but I can always think about things to talk about so I want to go touch back on the Netflix gay movies um, the reason I want to is I was telling you before about the portrayal of the two chaps from the um, Prince for Christmas movie with um, LGBT characters within these Christmas movies and in general the portrayal of them is a it's a lot more nuanced and a lot more realistic than they used to be. You gave an example of the first person that had appeared um, in a role in the past. And the only um, reason that worked was because it was a Broadway play done as a telecast. Mm, so people knew yeah. that character existed. Like it was not something created for that telecast. So. Mm. But the thing is, these roles are more, far more nuanced now, Prince for Christmas they're treated as like full members, like full, um, pe they're, they're treated as normally as any other character within the movie. Like there's nothing like big given to that, to their sexuality or such, like no, oh, la gasp, you two are gays. But it, it's just treated as part of who they are. Um, I think you would quite enjoy one of the main supporting characters from uh, a castle for Christmas, um, the new um, Christmas movie on Netflix. Oh, I'm kicking myself. It's got Drew Barrymore, by the way, in there as a, as a supporting uh, character. I'm it, looking at it, oh, it, Brooke it, Shields and Carrie Oldman in it. That's Brooke great. Brooke Shields. Oh, yes, that's what I was. That's what I was thinking. It's Brooke Shields, like proper Netflix Christmas movie. One oh, of her Stephen Oswald is in it. He's kind of dreamy. Look at that. Hello, Stephen Oswald. <laughs> her so she when she goes to Scotland to um, find her heritage and eventually get this castle, she joins a group of local knitters, um, and she becomes a knitter herself, which is just an awesome little thing. And the male member of the knitters, he is a widower. His husband passed away but he's oh. joined the knitters for companionship. But it's lovely to see an older gay man character, like a, a nice normal chap that's portrayed in the movie. And he's just there as a, as a good friend and such. I would like to use the Grinch, um, and we're approaching an hour already actually, so maybe we'll have to do a part two of Christmas films. Mm. Um, but I would like to just to use the Grinch as kind of a wedge into the discussion of um, the sanitization of the erotic in Christmas uh, yeah. because they use it as kind of a weapon in the live action Grinch movie. Um, Christine Baranski's character sexualizes herself essentially in a way mm -hmm. nobody else is in that movie. Um, the live action Grinch is crude in a way that only Jim Carrey can be but still be not so unsettling. But mm -hmm. I think it's the only except for a very, very lazy reference to boners in an Everybody Loves Raymond episode. I think it's yes. the only Christmas special film anything, because even in like single Santa seeks Mrs. Claus, God, that's so hard to say. Um, there's not, <laughs> so uh, I can't even say it's slow apparently, but there's not a lot of sexuality in general. It's very Hallmark mm -hmm. movie sexuality. Um, and for uh, straight Christmas movie fans with like movies like Holidays and Handcuffs, that could definitely go erotic, but it never does, which is kind of disappointing. Like if I had the guy from Holidays and Handcuffs and Handcuffs spending the holidays in the cabin, like stuff would probably happen. Not going to lie. I mean, you've already got the handcuffs. It just seems rude not to use them. I would actually like to talk about queerness in White Christmas. Um, since we're talking about everything being queer, 
I would like to talk a little bit about the idea of intimate male relationships, specifically because White Christmas, the movie mirrors kind of the backstage, um, the backstageness of it as a film. So mm-hmm. Danny Cri- Danny Kay comes in. Basically, White Christmas almost didn't get made. They could not find four people to cast for these four leads. I know it's hard to imagine anyone, but Bing Crosby and Danny Kay and Rosemary Clooney and Bear Ellen, but they almost lost Rosemary Clooney because they took so long finding casting. Fred Astaire was almost in this movie because he had done other Christmas films. And I think Ben Crosby maybe didn't want to do it. He played a lot of golf during the course of this movie from what Rosemary Clooney said in the DVD features. Um, but what's interesting is that apparently Danny Kay spent most of this movie trying to get close to Bing Crosby, like trying to have either more of a friendship. Like, I don't know how Rosemary Clooney qualifies closeness. I don't know what that means to her exactly. Um, but in a way, kind of the barrier between um, Bing Crosby and Danny Kay in the movie, is there's a little bit of a barrier backstage because in the movie, uh, Danny Kay is a lot of a foil for a lot of Bing Crosby's kind of very serious nature. Um, and there was, I guess there was some of that backstage. And I know Bing comes from a really, uh, comes from really kind of old school Hollywood. Um, I don't want to call him, because he was a celebrity, but I don't know if celebrity culture for someone like Bing Crosby, because I, I don't really know if Bing as a crooner considered himself more of an actor or a musician or if it was like Bob Hope where he just had a lot of talents. So I don't actually know kind of what celebrity culture Bing Crosby had, but it was clear Danny Kay spends a lot of the movie trying to get close to him. And it's Mm -hmm. kind of interesting that a lot of the movie between Bing Crosby and Danny Kay is really about relationship and relationship building either with each other or with these women that are clearly analogs for themselves because they they pair up the dynamic dancer Vera Ellen with the nimble and hilarious Danny Kay, and they pair up Rosemary Clooney, who cannot dance, but who sings amazingly, um, with Bing Crosby, who can also not dance, but sings amazingly. So, yeah. Ooh, how much time have we got left? I've just seen the clock. Um... I, I, I have all the time in the world for you. Um, Excellent. Um, Shall we move on, though, to the one that you wanted to discuss? Sure. Okay. Yes. Sorry. I'm going to want to come back to Brad Ruth because I think we should talk about um, the sitcom he was on, uh, Partners, um, because the uh, the elf uh, Bernard from uh, the Santa Claus movie plays their boss. Um, you know about later, though. <laughs> yeah. Um, so I want to talk about the super hilarious and super gay Christmas in Connecticut from 1945. Uh, Barbara Stanwyck is in it, if I remember correctly. I'm going to look at the IMDb real quick. Um, and yeah, so it's Barbara Stanwyck. Is, is, it's this great kind of like, it's that usual 1940s um, not telling each other movie plot, and that causes all of the problems that are going on. And Barbara Stanwyck basically plays this figurehead food columnist that cannot cook. And so um, S.Z. Sakal, who is a really great character actor, kind of the male version of, um, what's her name? The, the, the maid from All About Eve, whose name I can't remember. Um, anyway, S.Z. Sakal plays her uncle Felix, who is this cook who has been secretly feeding her recipes for her entire career. <laughs> and she basically gets manipulated into going to this house in Connecticut for Christmas, hosting a guy from the Navy who has fallen in love with her. And then in the middle of the movie, she has to kidnap a baby because she's talked about having a, having a child. Um, and so she basically has to kidnap a neighbor's baby or something. And then the neighbor comes back for the baby. Uh, and and then the uh, the Navy guy is like, watching the kidnapping happen and breaks out. Oh, it's an amazing movie. Um, this is one of those kind of classic Barbara Stanwyck 
woman with gumption, but also somehow hysterical at the same time movie. This is this is one of those. And and somehow doesn't get herself arrested. She doesn't get arrested and she ends up with the hot navy guy in the end. Like they like there's like this thing where he's like chasing her around a bedroom at the end, pretending to be a scoundrel because he knows all her secrets, but she doesn't know the secret that he knows her secrets. And there's like this thing where they're both clinging on this very phallic looking bedpost and then they kiss. It's amazing. I think they actually get married at the end of the movie because it was 1945. Um, what, what kind of morals is this teaching us for Christmas? I mean, the moral of the story is go to a house you don't own in Connecticut after you've scammed a job using your uncle's prowess and marry a hot Navy guy and have a kid with him. Like, that's the moral of the story. Um, I think maybe we should wrap this up um, in a minute. All right, thank yeah. you everyone. And I hope you have a dragalicious day. I don't know what our sign up is gonna be, but that's what I'm gonna go with to start with. Have a dragalicious Christmas season, everyone. <laughs> bon voyage, everyone. <laughs> bon voyage, bon appétit. <laughs> uh, I think part of, part of Bob's Burgers embracing Thanksgiving in a way that other shows haven't mm -hmm. is just because probably of Bob and Bob's predilection for fresh food. I happen to think their Dawn of the Peck, uh, not quite zombie turkey analog, is maybe <laughs> one of the best Thanksgiving episodes. It's right up there with the one where the turkey keeps dropping in the toilet. Um, I think it has a lot to do with the structure of Bob, the idea of togetherness, the idea of family. Uh, the one where his dad is yes. line dancing at a gay bar is amazing. Um, mm. the, the the Bob episode with Big Bob, where Big Bob best friends, he just goes into a gay bar um, and he line dances with them. That's what he does. Like Thursday is how I get away with murder night or something like that. And I, I appreciate that kind of thing. So and what's interesting is you get on TV too, um, when you look at different Family Guy Christmas specials, for instance, um, some of them are very heavily Christmas some of them really understand Christmas and some of them assume you've never seen Christmas before. Um, <laughs> I actually, I really enjoy TV Christmas specials tend to be mm -hmm. some of my favorite ones. Um, Last Gingerbread House on the left or The Bleakening from Bob Burgers is definitely holiday viewing in my house. Mm. Um, the amount of TV sitcoms in the 90s that did a It's a Wonderful Life type episode or a Christmas Carol episode. Oh. Um, you can't even count them on your hands. There's so many. So you've got Boy Meets World like, and Family Matters. Both did them. Um, I don't like this Christmas film. I think it's really sappy and saccharine, but I really love Jimmy Stewart. Um, what is the name of this film? Okay, It's a Wonderful Life. Yeah. Um, so apparently I found this out. Jimmy Stewart, it is time during World War II, I think in the Air Force. Um, he he acquired severe PTSD. And so his breakdown in It's a Wonderful Life is literally a breakdown he's having as a PTSD survivor. So like it's on film, which explains why it's so uncomfortable for me to watch because it's like, mm -hmm. he's not acting. That's really him unraveling a little bit in the film. Um, I have opinions about It's a Wonderful Life. I think it's his least, I think it's his least good work, I think for me. But that's just how I feel. I remember watching um, Into the Woods a while back. Just something. This the reason this is related is just what you were talking about the differences of the film to the stage play. Um, watched Into the Woods, and then I read about how the play had quite a few extra bits, and they added. They had some songs in it that were, didn't make it into the theatrical production. So I'm not entirely certain how to feel about that because I know that a lot of people didn't enjoy into the woods i enjoyed it for what it was I'm gonna say those um, people are those people are wrong because they couldn't handle that it was going to be an adaptation of it they thought it was going to be like a straight but you can't so so one of the things they change it into the woods the the uh, the stage show versus the film is they desexualize the wolf and the whole point of the wolf is to be sexual so like it makes mm -hmm. sense to me that um one of the people we mutually follow on instagram kgz87 he talks about his time playing the wolf mm. in Into the Woods. And the wolf is sexualized so much that his tail is supposed to be shaped like a penis. 
Like <laughs> the idea is that this Wolf Red Riding thing is an almost uncomfortable analog um, to becoming promiscuous or sexually free. I'm not actually sure what the analog is supposed to be. Um, but what, what's interesting is that like, I don't know why people thought Disney was going to make another, like, I didn't know if they thought they were going to get another bed knobs and broomsticks where it was like creepy <laughs> and very true to the original story. But like, there were some things that are in the stage play that Disney, there's just no way Disney would do. Although Billy Magnuson and Chris Pine ripping their shirts on a waterfall. Like, I mean, I, you know, there were some things I'm willing to forego for that. So, 